Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Main Street Finance Podcast. I'm, of course, Alex, your host, and today we have the faded interview with a mortgage lender. Matt Akins joins us today, and he is a heavy hitter in the real estate market up here in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And Matt, welcome to the show. Yeah, glad to be here. Excited to be here. You yeah. sure? Answer some questions. Tell some jokes. Laugh at your jokes is probably what I'll do mostly. So. Well, good, because honestly, that's the only reason he's here, because none of you laugh that I can see. <laughs> Too good. So, Matt, I already introduced you as a mortgage lending loan officer. Lending? Guru, yeah, yeah, loan, loan Guru. officer. Guru, I yeah. like that one better. That, that's on the business card. Yeah, yeah. That's All right, so what does a mortgage lending guru do? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm, I make home loans to people. Uh, on a daily basis, uh, uh, we're trying to advise and we're trying to uh, to help people uh, purchase a home. We're we're one of the integral parts to help you buy a house, and so yeah, I'll, I'll talk plenty about just exactly what we do and how we help and and what you do to help us uh, uh, help you get into a house. <laughs> help me help you yeah. get into a house <laughs> exactly. So you can hire help now. <laughs> so. People come to you to buy a house. What's kind of the typical situation or the story when people first walk into your office? Yeah, so there, there's a couple of places you can start uh, whenever you're uh, buying a house. Uh, a lot of people start with a realtor. Uh, uh, the real estate agent uh, will help you access a home to look at, negotiate a contract, talk to the seller or other real estate agent about repairs needed or renegotiations, kind of have those hard conversations. Insurance agents help you in the process, uh, but the, the, the mortgage lender, the home loans, uh, the home lender is going to help you with the actual financing and all that goes with that. So there's a lot of requirements to help you with a, uh, getting a home loan. So we uh, walk you through that process, hold your hand through the process, try to make it as smooth as possible at the beginning you're looking for a house, you're, you're excited, a little bit nervous, uh, and then hopefully a month later, you're at a closing table, you know, shaky hand, <laughs> signing paperwork, all the paperwork you can think of, uh, oh, yeah. so you can get into that house and move right in. So, <laughs> As I said earlier in the podcast, I purchased my home uh, about three months ago, hour and a half of signing papers. <laughs> <laughs> and it could be a lot longer if you want to read every single word, but... Um, uh, uh, but it's good. The, the, our goal is really to make you as comfortable as possible in that transaction. So that's our uh, that's our focus. Is is anything any surprises that come up? We're expecting it, and we make you feel good about it as well. Well, alrighty then. Well, let me ask you this. So last week I interviewed Coley Bailey, a real estate agent, and he highly recommended that the first step in buying a home is to talk to a lender. Now, would you say they should come talk to you first? Because you had said talk to the realtor first. So I'm seeing a kind of no, go to him. No, go to him. <laughs> so really, the, the true first step is really with the lender. We usually get customers that have already talked to a realtor. And then, like you said, the realtor, typically the first thing they're going to say is, well, have you been pre-qualified? And so getting pre-qualified is, is talking to me. So we want you to come in. We do it over the phone. We do it you know, through the internet, through an online application. We could certainly do it in person. Spend 30, 45 minutes with us. Talk about personal information, employment and income information. We do pull your credit. And then we, we kind of figure out what's the best loan program for you. Some of the time, we can't get you qualified right off the bat, but we can give you some advice for what you should do to help you get pre-qualified in the future. And then sometimes we can get you pre-qualified right then and there, and you walk out the door with a pre-qualification letter. And that letter is what gives the realtor that confidence that, okay, they've talked to a bank, they will be able to afford a home, I can show them, you know, this size house, the letter says what amount they qualify for. And so that's why the realtor is suggesting you see a lender first. It's m probably most common for people to visit with the realtor and then them kind of direct them to the bank. So, yeah. <laughs> so just to summarize, what you're saying it's the most common that people will talk to a realtor first, but you're saying the better idea might be to get the prequal first? Yeah, it's it's smart. Uh, a lot of times people that have really done their research will come to a bank first because they, they get to a point in their research where they're a little unsure of, I don't know what I can afford. I don't I haven't seen my credit in years. I've never seen my credit. Uh, and, and sometimes talking to a realtor feels like there's this obligation there to... I've got to, once I've called a realtor, like, I'm serious. I'm going to buy a house soon. 
And so sometimes we'll get somebody who's done a lot of research that they come into the bank to just ask questions. And that's great. Education is part of what we want to do in our advice and our guidance. So uh, so yes, going to the bank first is, is a smart way to do it. Certainly got to be more efficient when someone comes to you prepared. Yeah. Oh, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And honestly, we like to give recommendations. So if somebody comes in and they're unsure about how the realtor situation works, a lot of people don't know that the the realtor commission, like how a realtor gets paid, mm-hmm. is from the seller side of the transaction. And so if they don't know that, for a lot of first time home buyers don't know that. If they don't know that, then they're thinking, God, how am I going to pay the realtor? I don't even know what the realtor charges. And so if you talk to a banker first, then we can kind of clear up some of those uh, urban legends and myths as far as real estate transactions go. Yeah. Would you say the money side is more or less stressful than maybe what the realtors help them with? I would say that the usually the financing, the money side is more stressful. Uh, and it's probably just more unknowns and less understanding of kind of how it operates. Uh, but there are things that can come up in, in any facet of it. And so what the realtor is helping you with is in the negotiations part of it. And that can obviously be stressful because most of the time when you're talking to your realtor, they're talking to the seller or they're talking to the other real estate agent involved. Uh, so you're always kind of kept in the dark of what the seller's thinking is. And so trying to negotiate repairs or, you know, are you going to pay my closing costs for me? That can be stressful, but the bank is probably more likely to have a support a surprise, something that you you weren't expecting is a requirement or a condition of that loan. All right. And taking a step back, we've said the word pre-qualification five or six times at this point. What exactly is a pre-qualification? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. It used to be synonymous with pre-qualification or pre-approval. And in, in banking lingo, those are really two different things. A pre-qualification is that you have uh, applied with a lender. We have pulled your credit and we have looked at your application. And so based on what you told us, based on what employment you have, what income you make, what your credit report says, you should qualify for financing. That's pre-qualification. So we don't actually collect any paperwork. We don't verify anything at that point. We're just going off of, I make this much money, this is my job, you know, this is what my credit score is, you should qualify for financing. A pre-approval or, or kind of the next step in the transaction which really usually happens after you've found a house, after you have a contract on a house, uh, is actually verifying all that information. So, okay, you said you make $15 an hour and you work 40 hours a week. We need a pay stub and last year's W-2 to verify that you actually do make $15 an hour and work 40 hours a week. So we've got to verify that. We've got to have some type of paperwork to to confirm that information. So that's where an approval or or you could do a pre-approval if you really wanted to. That's where that comes in. So a pre-qualification is just got my credit pulled and based on my stated income, this is what I should qualify for. Gotcha. So would it be fair to say that a pre-qualification is a lot like you go into the bank, you simply just tell them they pull your credit or you tell them some information, they pull your credit, and it's sort of a the bank saying, hey, at the face value, based on what they told us, here's what we would approve them for. Yeah. And then using that letter, the person would go to the realtor, go out, put a contract on a house, come back and say, hey, here's the house I got. And at that point we go, okay, so we have this that we started with. Now we're going to need to verify everything you told us at the beginning. And for that, you got to give us the documentation. Perfect way to put it. Face value. At face value, you should qualify for this amount. That's exactly what it is. Perfect. Gotcha. All right. So we got our pre-qualifications nailed down. So we had said pre-qualification, then they go to the realtor. So do you maintain contact with people after the original pre-qualification or is it just kind of here's your letter, see you when you get a contract? Everybody's a little bit different. Most of the time, uh, we don't talk to the client again until they found the house that they like and they've negotiated a contract. We like to talk to people in between. Uh, some people find a house the weekend after we visited with them and some people don't find something for six months or a year. Or their situation changes and they want to revisit on some sort of estimate or, or scenario. And we like that. So, you know, you came in, you wanted to get pre-qualified for a $150,000 house. You can't find what you want. Uh, uh, you know, your your wife has talked you into the 175 to 180 range. And so then you say, okay, listen, I need to know what this payment is going to look like and how much it changes. And so then we rework the estimate. We confirm you're pre-qualified for a higher amount. 
Uh, so that's the kind of scenario that comes up. You know, I want to know what the difference is now that we're looking at something slightly different. So that happens plenty of the time. But there are plenty of customers that uh, we get them pre-qualified. You know, a month goes by, and then the next communication we have is, here's a contract, you know, what's my next step? And so that, that happens all the time. And you know what? I think that's a perfect transition. So what would be the next step? So overall, you've met with a lender. You've gotten your pre-qualification letter, taken that lender, gone to your realtor. And if you don't know what to do then, go back and listen to the interview with the realtor episode. <laughs> right. After you put in the contract on the house, they come back to you mm -hmm. and say, okay, I got the house, or I got the contract on the house. What is the next step? Yeah. So that's, we, we call that the, that's the gunshot. That's the start of the clock. So when you have a contract on a house, we can do a lot at that point. And so the contract uh, dictates the details of the transaction. And so at that point, we, can, we know what your closing date should be. So we can get your interest rate locked in for a certain amount of time to fit that closing date. We'll start asking for those documentation items. So your pay stubs, your W-2s, maybe a tax return, maybe a bank statement, some of those type items. So once we've got, we've locked you in, we have the financial documents. Uh, we'll have some disclosure items, so some paperwork to go through with you. Any more, most of that stuff is just e-signable. So it, it's just an email and uh, e-sign and move on. Uh, and then we order the appraisal. And then it, unfortunately, it feels a little bit like a hurry up and wait kind of situation. Appraisals take a couple of weeks to get back. So when we get locked in, paperwork done, order the appraisal, there's typically a, a week or two where we just kind of wait all that paperwork that we've collected, we then send to someone called an underwriter. The underwriter is the decision maker. The underwriter does not meet the client in any scenario. So the underwriter's job is to take the paperwork and make sure it fits whatever loan program that we're looking at. And then they tell us if we're missing anything else. So while we're waiting on the appraisal to come back, the underwriting happens. And so by the time the appraisal comes back, now we know, okay, we've missed a couple of small paperwork items and the appraisal is back and the value is good, or maybe there's some repairs needed on the house. And then at that point, we kind of wrap up everything, and it's only a week or so before we can actually close, get you in the house. All right, so that entire process was the next step. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing, yeah. Sounded like all of them. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> well, there you go. Just replay it. <laughs> So yeah, there there's a lot more that goes into the underwriting phase, but that but the next step is really lock your interest rate, collect some financial paperwork, sign some disclosure paperwork, and order the appraisal. That feels like the next step, and then the waiting period kind of has its own details to it. Gotcha. Okay, Matt. So we covered a whole lot in that last minute or two here. I want to go back and cover a couple of those topics okay. a little bit clearer. Sure. So one of the things you had mentioned was lock in an interest rate. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah. So the interest rate, most products that we offer are a fixed interest rate. So once we have locked your interest rate, uh, that rate's not going to change. It's not going to go up or down during the process and uh, it's never going to go up or down once we've closed on your loan. Locking the interest rate is dependent on a whole bunch of factors. Your credit score, what loan program we're using, how much you're putting down uh, in your transaction. So it, it factors in a lot of different things to be able to tell what interest rate are we able to offer. So when we quote you an interest rate, uh, we're going to say, hey, today's interest rate is 3.25%. And we're able to lock that in for 30 days or 45 days or 60 days, however long is necessary for your closing date. There are some different rate options. Uh, rates do depend on term as well. So uh, that might be a 30-year interest rate, while a 20-year or a 15-year is a shorter or a lower interest rate for shorter terms. There is also uh, the ability to buy down your interest rate. This gets a little bit complicated, so talk to your lender. But if I offer you a 3.25 interest rate, you can get a 3% interest rate, but you have to pay more closing costs to be able to do it. We call those discount points. So you pay an additional closing cost to lower your rate so your monthly payment is also lower. And sometimes there's a lot of options. So it might be 3.25 with no points, 3% with $1,000 of points, 2.5% with $3,000. And so there, there's some scenarios there. And so it just, it ends up depending on, do you want to pay more now to save money in the long run? 
and it's all based on some break-even point. Uh, <laughs> and so we can do that math for you, or you can figure it out as well. All righty. And so I assume since we're locking interest rates and that that's a thing, that these things, that rates change quite often. Yeah, uh, they do. So we get a daily interest rate sheet. Some lenders actually live quote interest rates. And so their rates can change throughout the day. But how we operate is basically one rate a day. The market fluctuates. And so it's not just the stock market. Uh, the Fed uh, sets uh, commercial interest rates. Uh, the unemployment rate can affect it. International economy items can affect it. There's a lot of things that go into how our interest rates are determined. And then our own profit margin. The bank is in business to make money. And so there is a, a sliver of profit margin that shows up in there. And so we get to set our own rates. And that's also why you might see a slight difference in pricing between this bank and the bank down the road. Their closing costs might be slightly more, but their rate is a little bit better. Uh, and so it, it honestly, it, it's a good, uh, allows you to compare uh, bank to bank based on, okay, what are the closing costs? What are the points, those discount points we talked about? And then what's the actual interest rate? And if you really want to compare apples to apples, you should be comparing the APR, uh, the annual percentage rate, which is essentially the interest rate plus closing costs in, a, in an annualized equation. And so that, uh, that's something you should probably Google if you really want to know how it works. Uh, but if you compare APR at this bank to APR at that bank, that's a true comparison um, all in costs, all in. That's a good way to put it. Alrighty. So, and then the points and the terms. So points were basically you pay an extra fee and you can get your rate reduced. That's right. And then the calculation is different bank to bank. So check with your lender. And then the terms. Terms are that, so maybe you get 4% if it's a 30 year loan, but if it's a 20 year loan, maybe it's three and a half. So is it something like that? Yeah. So how the pricing works for us is usually the 30 year interest rate is one thing. The 20 year interest rate is slightly less. And then the 15 year rate is actually quite a bit less. Those are the tiers that we operate off of uh, where the pricing really gets better. So anything between, we can do a lot of different terms. Those aren't the only three options. But if you do a 21 year or a 25 year term, it's just based on the 30 year interest rate. It changes a little at 20 years and then changes more at 15 years. So to give you some example, yeah, if the 30-year rate was 4% today, then 20-year is probably 3.875. It's just barely less. But then 15 might be 3.25%. So it's quite a bit less. And so it's so, kind of scales. It's a much bigger difference the farther back from 30 years you go. That's right. That's right. And we talk about 30 because 30 is the maximum term. That's the That's the longest amount allowed. 15 is not the shortest amount allowed. Uh, it's just where the biggest price break happens. Gotcha. So that's just kind of the key points. Yeah. Like you can get anywhere in there, but Definitely. those are the most popular, most used. Yeah. I think what a lot of people uh, end up looking at too is because you get that interest rate break at 15 years, they always want to know, well, like how much bigger is my payment going to be? And it's not double. It's not even close to double. So a lot of people like looking at it because – you know, if your payment was going to be $1,000 for 30 years, it's only $1,300 for 15 years. How is that possible? And the calculation for, for interest and long-term interest. Uh, amortization. Yeah, long-term amortization. Uh, that's just how it works. It, it You know, these interest rates might be fantastic, but you're paying, you know, what feels like double the cost in 30 years, it's not the interest rate. It's the amount of time that you have the loan that costs so much. Right. It's because you're paying your house off faster. Well, you got to give them the money faster, which means higher payments. That's right. That's right. All righty. And the next thing we had mentioned, you got to get an appraisal an appraisal takes a couple weeks. So what is an appraisal and how does it relate to, or what's its place in you getting your loan? Yeah. So the appraisal protects all of us. It really does. The appraisal is the report that tells us the value of the house, the marketability of the house, and the condition of the house. So most people think of an appraisal as that says that the, the house is worth a certain amount of money. And that's right. And that's, that's the biggest purpose of it, is to confirm that it's worth what you're paying for it. So if it comes in less than whatever your purchase price is, that is honestly your opportunity to renegotiate the price. 
So we're under contract on this house for 150,000. The appraisal report comes back, it's 145. Uh, you know, you can go back to the seller and say, hey, I really like this house, but the appraisal says it's worth 145,000. I want to buy it, but at its market value. Now, how the appraisal actually operates. So the appraiser's job is to go out, look at the house, inspect the house, tell us the condition of the house. So is everything working in the house? Do the sinks work? Do the toilets flush? Do all the lights turn on? Um, you know, do the utilities work appropriately? So basic conditions of the house. And then tell us a value based on other homes that have sold that are like it. Comparable sales, or most people just call them comps, uh, is how that works. So you need to have at least three comps. So when you buy your house and it's 1,500 square feet and it's $150,000, the appraiser is going to go out, look at the last year in the area and find three, four, five houses that are similar, as similar as possible, and then compare it to this house that you're trying to buy. So the appraiser uses those comps and says, okay, this one sold for 160, but it's slightly bigger. So I'm going to adjust value a little bit for that. And this one should be worth about 150. There is one house down the road that sold for 135 and it's the same size. So maybe that that comp shows a slightly lesser value. And then it's just averaged over however many comps there are to come up with that value and say, okay, the market value for this house, based on averages, based on the comps that we found, is or is not what you're trying to buy it for. Alrighty. So it does give you that value. It gives you a whole lot of other stuff, but it gives you that value so that both you and your lender can feel confident that you're borrowing a reasonable amount of money to be able to purchase this house and that you are purchasing the house for a reasonable amount of money and not you're being you're drastically overpaying or drastically underpaying. Exactly. And really I mentioned that it protects everyone. It it does. So a lot of times it's protecting the seller in that let's say you were the buyer and it was 150,000 and you kind of thought that was that was overpriced. Uh, the appraisal comes in at 158 and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't even know I was getting a good deal. And now the seller doesn't even know the value of the home, but there, it provides a protection for the seller. This is really what it's worth. And then it does protect the bank as well. So if it does come in less, then you need to renegotiate with the seller or you've got to come up with the difference. We're not going to lend more money based on what the price is now. We're going to do it based on the value. And so somebody's got to make up the difference. That's where that renegotiation comes in. You're asking the seller to make up that difference and not have to do that yourself. Uh, you can always pay out of pocket the difference. That's always allowed. Um, and you can always buy the house out of pocket. That's also true. <laughs> cash, cash offers always move a little bit quicker. Uh, <laughs> it just puts you out of a job real quick. <laughs> <laughs> real quick. So, uh, uh, but it does. It, it protects everybody in certain situations. All righty. So one more thing about appraisals that comes up in a lot of transactions is the condition of the house. And so uh, it's not uncommon for an appraiser to require some, some sort of repair or, or make notation of things that need repair in the house. And so every once in a while, a roof needs to be replaced or there's a broken window or you know there's rotting wood on the outside of the house or there's a leak under the sink. All those things require attention. It's not that they're a huge deal, and it's not that we're trying to be sticklers on it. It's that in its current state, the value is not, it can't be exactly right. Because if there's a leak under the sink and it's not immediately taken care of, it can cause a lot bigger problem. Mm -hmm. If there's a problem in the roof, it's not that the roof doesn't function. It's just if there's a small leak, it can cause a much bigger issue. And so the the safety and soundness of the home is now uh, in jeopardy. And so that's why sometimes this little repair or this little item on an appraisal seems really important. Or how could this be a deal breaker? How could this be, you know, how could the bank require something so small, so minute? Uh, and it's just, it's, it's that safety and soundness factor of the property. So it's like the house is worth 200,000, but if this leak in the sink doesn't, you know, cause a big problem and cost you $10,000 in repairs. Exactly. Exactly. And so uh, we call that a subject to appraisal. It's subject to repair. It's subject to something. Gotcha. So it'd be worth this if you fix that. Right. That's exactly right. 
Okay, so the appraisal. The appraisal is a third party. Someone comes in, an expert that values the property. That's right. Would it be, just to make a really, really rough uh, metaphor here, it's a lot like your favorite, let's, say, let's not get sued by naming a specific one, uh, your favorite pawn TV show. Some guy comes up and is like, hey, I want to sell you this. And the guy's like, uh, I'll buy it for this, but I, I really got to talk to my guy who's an expert in this. Let me call this dude in. Guy comes in, oh, yeah, that's a this, 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 this. Yeah, it's worth that much. And so because of the information that your guy has, that's kind of the your reference point for how much you should be paying for this. That's right. I mean, it's we're just asking an expert uh, or a star to come in and value that property. That's exactly right. Yeah, as long as it doesn't have anything to do with pawn, because we can't have a star have anything to do with that, because <laughs> we don't want to get in trouble here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's good stuff. Alrighty, Matt. So we covered pre-qualification, we covered appraisals, we covered a little bit of documentation. Uh, what about the underwriting? You had said we go out to an underwriter and it's very specific that you don't meet this person, so are they a ghost? It feels like they're a ghost. I mean, that's what it feels <laughs> like. Uh, but yeah, the underwriter is just the decision maker. So the underwriter is the one that actually reviews, you know, based on our loan program, what guidelines, what requirements do we have to meet? And then they look at your financial items, the disclosure paperwork, and they just make sure that we've met every condition that we have to. They also review the appraisal. Uh, they review the contract just to make sure everything is happening according to the contract and according to the guidelines that are set by our loan program. So, yeah, the fact that you don't know who this person is or what their name is or where they're located is weird. It's just a weird thing. Uh, but the underwriter is the one who tells us, tells the loan officer, who then tells the customer, you know, here's what we have left to do. You know, we collected your pay stub, we collected your W-2 and bank statements. We need to show proof of what this large deposit was that came in your bank account. And we need to get one more pay stub uh, uh, to show, you know, overtime income. There's all these little specifics that an underwriter can ask for. Frankly, some of the conditions or some of the questions that an underwriter has uh, can be a little invasive. It's just to clarify something, to meet a guideline, but every once in a while you'll get asked a question that, that feels personal, and, and you just can't take it personally. It's just to help you get to the finish line, which is purchasing a home. Moral of the story, gang. Uh, love your credit analyst. <laughs> all we do is care. <laughs> and good. want all your information. That's it. That's all we want. Yeah. We have spreadsheets that we have to fill. That's right. I forget you're an underwriter. You're a commercial underwriter, so you know what the, you know how this works. <laughs> so another term that you had mentioned a couple times now is loan program. Uh, what does that mean? Sure. So when you purchase a home, uh, we're going to use one of a few different loan programs to get you into the house. There's quite a few loan programs that we have to offer. Uh, but there are the most popular and the most common uh, by a long shot based on the long-term interest rate uh, uh, that, that's fixed. Uh, the, the terms, there, there's some programs that are designed to be the cheapest if you put a big down payment. There's some that are designed to get you qualified for the most. There's some that are designed for a minimum down payment. And so each person's scenario is a little bit different. And so there's a loan program for a lot of different situations so if you go back originally, a long time ago, what did it take to buy a house? Everybody had to have 20% to buy a house. That's a conventional loan. Now, you don't have to have 20% to buy a house now, but that is the conventional loan product. That's the most common loan product. Even the conventional loan doesn't require 20% down anymore. But if you don't have 20% down, you're going to have this thing called mortgage insurance. Mortgage insurance is just a monthly insurance premium that you pay that protects the bank uh, because it's considered a higher risk loan if you don't put 20% down. The rest of the programs kind of branch out based on uh, what down payment you're going to put on your purchase. So if you can put 20% down in almost every scenario, the conventional loan will be the best fit. If you want to put less money down or if you need to put as little money as possible down, uh, you have some other options. So the next most popular program is the FHA loan program. The FHA loan program is super black and white. So 
As long as you qualify, your credit score doesn't matter that much. It doesn't affect your interest rate. Everybody basically gets the same interest rate, and everybody has the same mortgage insurance premium. The FHA loan is a 3.5% down loan product. So 3.5% of whatever the purchase price is. If you're buying a house for $200,000, you have to have $7,000 of down payment needed. The FHA loan is also the product that has the lowest interest rate as far as the 30-year products are concerned. It used to just be called the first-time homebuyers program. And so a lot of people think of it as if you're a first-time homebuyer, you have to use the FHA loan or you can't use it if you're not a first-time homebuyer. And none of that's true. You don't have to be a first-time homebuyer. Anyone can use it. You can't have two FHA loans at a time. And it is meant for just your primary residence. But if you're buying a house and you need to put as little money down as possible, FHA is a good fit. Another loan program that's common, uh, or at least very desirable, is the Rural Development Program. A lot of people just call it the RD program. It's actually a zero down payment program, so desirable for that reason. The interest rate is also very good, very close to the FHA interest rate. It is a needs-based program, so it's designed to help not metro areas develop uh, or allow people to get into homes uh, with less requirements. And so the RD program does have an income limit based on whatever county you're purchasing in. Not all houses are eligible. So in our Northwest Arkansas market, the Fayetteville, Springdale, Rogers, Bentonville, if you're in city limits, you cannot have an RD loan. If you're looking for a home outside of that, there's an eligibility map to confirm that a property would qualify for RD financing. Uh, you also, if you have a lot of assets, again, it's a needs-based program, so you might not qualify if you have enough money to put down for a conventional loan or 20% or something like that. And then the, the VA loan, the Veterans Program, is a really good program, but it's just offered to veterans, obviously. It's also a no-down no payment program, and it actually doesn't have a mortgage insurance premium, so it's a really desirable program. Really, the only con to the product is that there is a funding fee. There's an upfront fee. It's financed in, but it's a pretty good-sized fee, depending on what the VA tells us how much to charge. So are we talking like a percent or like less than a percent? So the VA funding fee is it's about 2.2% the first time you use it, 2.2% of the purchase price. If this is not your first time to use the VA program, it's up to 3.6%. So it gets pretty hefty pretty quick, especially if you're buying a good size home. Like uh, at that point, why not just go with FHA? Uh, so it doesn't have a mortgage insurance premium. So right. the and it doesn't require down payment. So if you're really trying to limit your down payment or keep your monthly payment as low as possible, VA is probably still better. Now, the fee is hefty. It's a good size fee. Yeah. Uh, but that might not outweigh the other options. So, you know, if you're buying a house for 200000 the FHA scenario, you have to have $7,000 down payment, and your payment might be $1,400 a month. The VA, you don't have to have down payment, and your payment might be $1,300 a month. You're borrowed more, but because you don't have that mortgage insurance monthly premium, the VA loan typically has a smaller monthly payment. Hmm. This is just the first time I'm hearing of the VA loan program like having an upfront fee. So I was like, it's, I was curious. Yeah, the v, so the funding fee is kind of the only con to the program. It has its little stipulations and a little extra paperwork, but the VA program is a lot of times a, a good fit. One other thing worth mentioning on the VA program the VA tells us what fee to charge. So I, I kind of gave a range, that 2.2 to 3.6. Uh, it's up to the VA to tell us what to charge. But if you're disabled over a certain percentage, I, I, it's weird to me that the VA... Yeah, the military classifies, classifies... I have a lot of friends. It's uh, They classify as a percentage. It's not like you lose one arm, you're 25% disabled. Right. It's your capability of doing full-time work and if there's a veteran in the audience please forgive me if i said that wrong or if that's not the <laughs> most optimal optimal way to have said it but yes the military classifies you a certain percentage disabled depending on the extent of your injuries right so if you're over a certain percent then you're exempt of the funding fee and so that's another reason why if you're exempt of the funding fee, it, the VA program is oh. the best by far. Oh, yeah. No mortgage insurance, no down payment. Nothing. Yeah, no funding fee. I mean, 
uh, it would be better than conventional at that point. Oh yeah. Uh, but we do have we do have customers that ha- really have to weigh it. They have enough for a twenty percent down payment. Should I do a conventional loan or should I just do the VA loan and take advantage of maybe not putting as much money down? And so there's an actual question there, and that's hopefully what our advice is is useful for. Hopefully, hopefully it's always useful. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right, so we've been through most of the process here. We have, you've gotten your pre-qualification, you've gone to your lender, you've come back, you've gotten your appraisal, maybe you've gone to your realtor and you've gotten your inspection, you got the loan program. Uh, so then there's there's just closing left, right? Right. All yeah. right, and so from the, we already talked about closing a little bit with Coley, our real estate agent. So from the mortgage side, what what does closing look like, or how does that process? Sure. So we've we've talked about the the underwriter and the conditions and getting the appraisal back. Uh, so once we've cleaned all that up, we've really wrapped it up in a little bow, uh, gotten the conditions met, then we're ready to close. And so you're going to close at a title company or at an attorney's office, a closing company of some sort. And there's a few things you should probably know about closing. So closing is where everything happens. So they're going to close specifically based on the details of the contract. There is some interpretation that happens there based on if seller close are paying your closing costs for you or uh, you know there was a termite inspection uh, required. It was in the contract. So the title company really is going to close based on those details. From the financing end of it, we've got uh, a final document that says at the beginning of the transaction, we gave you this estimate of what it's going to look like. But it has some assumptions in it, and it has some estimates in it. It's meant to be that. When we get to the closing stage, we're going to give you one called the closing disclosure. The closing disclosure is the finalized numbers. It is nothing's an estimate anymore. Now we have exactly what your insurance is. We know exactly what the taxes on the property are. The title company has given us their fees. We have, uh, you know, if there were any renegotiations of value or seller paid closing costs, All that's been finalized, and so now we know exactly how much money you need at the table. We know exactly how much your monthly payment's going to be. So once that's finalized, we're going to give you that ahead of closing. So you know exactly what to expect when you go to the closing table. And so when you close on a home, you either need to wire the funds or bring a cashier's check to the closing. Uh, You cannot show up and just briefcase a cash. Uh, At least I've never heard of that. Uh, You can't write a personal check over a certain amount of money. They want it to be verified funds uh, that you're using. And so the title company wants either a cashier's check or a wire transfer for those funds. And then they'll also ask for uh, a photo ID, a copy of your driver's licenses or a passport or something like that. And that's because they're going to notarize like half the documents at the closing table. So those are the main things that you're, you're going to bring. Uh, One question that you get every once in a while, the realtor probably answered it, but typically the keys are brought to the closing. So like you literally sign the paperwork, hand it to the title company person, and they hand you the keys. So (laughs) that transaction happens at the closing table. So the financing is kind of in preparation. What did we have to do to prepare for the closing table? So sort of like everyone comes together to one table, which we've done this summary before. Everyone comes to the closing table. You put in your down payment check, your lender's there, they put forward the loan check, both of those get given to the seller, the seller takes that, slides the keys across the table, and Bob's your uncle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and also, there's a guy in the back stamping a bunch of stuff and signing it. Right, right. That's a notary. I do, we, do, we still don't know exactly what a notary public is, but yes, they're very important. They just like to watch. They just and... like to watch. There's, and you can only get a stamp if you get the license. So it's a big deal. Gotcha. Gotcha. I I have my own set of pretty stamps. It's mostly stars, but uh, (laughs) I get a couple unicorns. (laughs) No, not a notary. (laughs) No, it's just a stamp. (laughs) All right. So we've basically covered the whole process from, at least from your point of view, from meeting the customer for the first time or the guy, that guy, girl, whoever is going to buy the house from meeting them for the first time all the way through sliding the money across the table and getting two pieces of metal that uh, open a wooden door. Uh, So we've gone basically beginning to end here. So we got a little bit of time left. Do you have any horror stories or maybe uh, things to avoid or just some fun anecdotes for us? Sure, yeah. And uh, I like this section just because it's so common for a young couple or somebody that's just unsure of the whole process comes in 
and they just talk about how they've heard these horror stories. It, it's so difficult to buy a house. I've heard it's really hard to get a, a loan with your bank. Some of those things, we hear that, and it just, oh, it makes us cringe because we feel like it's our job to make this as smooth and, and as easy as possible. And so, yeah, there are some kind of, there are some things that it's our job to try to set your expectations so you have some idea of what's coming. We don't want to surprise you, and we don't like it when deals fall through, but there's all sorts of things that can come up, and uh, most of them are not in my control, and very few of them are in your control as the client. So yeah, it's worth talking about a few different things. So one thing that people really have a hard time understanding is cash. Sometimes people keep cash in a, like a coffee can in their backyard or like in this treasure chest under their bed. And cash is something that we don't know how to verify. We don't know where it came from. And we have to be able to verify where your down payment or closing costs are coming from uh, from an eligible source. So what we're trying to verify is that it, it didn't come from a new loan or it didn't come from illegal activity. Selling a job selling a child. We can't verify it if it's cash. So, you know, if you're thinking in your mind, I got $10,000 under my bed in a coffee can and you go in and you meet with a lender and they say, you know, do you have money for a down payment? Yeah, I got $10,000. Okay, great. If that's where it stops, then we didn't do our job. We really want to know that it's in a checking account, a savings account, a brokerage account, somewhere to where there's a paper trail. If it's cash, if it's cold, hard cash, we can't verify. We don't know where it came from, and that's considered ineligible. And so even though you have it, we can't use that as a part of the transaction. And so there's ways around that. Deposit your cash now, buy a house a few months from now. We don't have to, we only have to look back two months, so that's totally fine. And then there's other places that your down payment or closing costs can come from, a gift from a family member. There's still ways to document other types of down payment. Cash is really, really difficult, basically impossible for us to handle. There's one thing that's kind of invasive for people uh, uh, that they don't like or, or can kind of cause a horror story. Sometimes we have to clarify something for the underwriter. We mentioned that the underwriter is just a person in a back room that's reading paperwork. They don't meet you. They don't know the whole situation every time. So every once in a while, they're going to ask a question that feels personal. And the reason they're asking it is something about the paperwork doesn't make sense. So there are situations that come up in divorce. There are situations that come up regarding child support. There are situations that come up regarding maybe a gap of employment. Maybe you didn't have a job for a few months, or maybe you went back to school for six months to finish your degree. Sometimes we don't see that on paper. So the underwriter comes back and they say, hey, they appear to have an eight-month employment gap. That's a problem. We, we need to verify what they were doing in the eight months. And so sometimes we'll go back to the client and we'll say, hey, you know, hopefully we say it as tactfully as possible. Uh, we see an employment gap. Can you tell us what you were doing in that amount of time? Did you go back to school? Did you have another job that we just didn't know about? Uh, and that way we have an answer for that question mark in the underwriter's head. The divorce situation, we want to know if your divorce is final. If it's not final, are there obligations associated with that? Are you now going to have to pay alimony or child support? There's all these things that are super personal questions. And the reason that we're asking is it affects your affordability. It affects what you can afford uh, if, you're, if you have a change coming or if you just had a change to your financial status. So some of those things are really personal. And so we're not trying to be invasive. We're trying to answer a question for the underwriter uh, that is important for your affordability. We don't want to know your personal drama. It's not our goal to find out why you left your husband or why you left your wife. That's not it at all. Uh, it's just to verify some financial aspect of your life. Um, you gotta hate those pesky uh, credit analysts. <laughs> like, all they do is just ask all these questions. <laughs> It's true. And w w one of the ones that I, I feel bad about, but sometimes we just have to ask to, to get confirmation. Uh, sometimes uh, someone who is disabled or, so, or maybe you had, maybe your employment gap had something to do with uh, a medical situation. We have to know sometimes just enough to be able to, to justify why you had an employment gap. And so 
I was in the hospital. I was on the edge of my life. You know, I was taking care of uh, uh, an elderly parent or grandparent. Uh, I mean, maybe I had a kid and just wanted to take a year off. Maternity leave, I mean, that is totally justifiable. But if it didn't show up on the paperwork somewhere, then we might have to have you write a little statement. So we know that, and so we have it documented. That's that's important for us. And so, yeah, sometimes we'll ask personal questions, uh, and it can feel a little invasive. It's just to answer a question or to clarify something for the underwriter. Something I'm curious about, just because I work in the commercial side, not so much mortgage, oh. but... I think some of that might be stuff for, like, regulators. Because as, as you and I know, banking is one of the most regulated industries in America. It's true. It could be someone comes and looks at your mortgage after the fact, you know, a regulator checking to make sure that, you know, we checked all the correct boxes, we did everything. If we don't have something on file, is it, like, I don't know, I'm actually asking. Yeah. Uh, is it possible they come through, see that there was an employment gap, and then say, hey, well, Matt, why didn't you ask them why, why is this gap here? Like, we don't have a reason. Uh, usually employment gaps are just to explain why there was a gap. Sometimes there isn't really a gap. You had an extra job, so we're asking you if there was something else there. Uh, sometimes people go back to school, so it's not an employment gap per se. You were doing school in between, and that's fine. We just get a school transcript to document it, and then we move forward. Uh, but yeah, sometimes there's an actual employment gap, and the, the reason the underwriter's asking, if you worked for 10 years and then... You just took two years off and you just started back up at work and now you want to go ahead and move. If you just took time off, our concern would be, are you going to buy this house and then take time off again? Now, if you took time off for a specific reason, uh, then that's the justification. But if you're possibly just going to take time off afterwards, we, we need to have some reasonable conclusion, yeah, that you're going to continue working, that you're going to be able to continue to make payments on the house. And so if there is really just a big employment gap and we can't explain it and there's no real justification, then you might not qualify for the house. That's that's the whole question. All righty, Matt. So we've talked about basically everything. We've gone from pre-qualification. We've gone through the entire loan process. We've gone through closing, sliding the cash across the table, hopefully a giant suitcase, but in reality, probably not. Uh, final question I'm going to ask you. Did you have fun? Had a blast. <laughs> Had a blast. Thanks for having me on. Uh, hope I get invited back uh, if the listeners like me. Uh, but yeah, I had a blast. <laughs> you better have liked them. Put it in the comments below. <laughs> well, Matt, I, you stole my last que- my actual last question, which is going to be, would you want to come back? Of course. I think it was a blast. I, I really had a good time. Um, uh, thanks for having me on. I like to consider myself a, a guru, uh, uh, but it was just fun to to shoot the breeze with you. All righty, guys. I hope you guys had as much fun listening and watching to this as we had making it, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to the Main Street Finance Podcast. Have a question on today's topics or have suggestions for future episodes? Send an email to mainstfinance at gmail.com. Sharing is caring, so if you learned something new and useful today, make sure you share with friends and family. Don't forget to like and subscribe to be notified of new episodes. For demonstrations and more examples, be sure to check out the YouTube channel. We'll see you next time.